Hello everybody and welcome to this, my first of two videos on the Canon FTB. We will also cover the FTB-N in this video, even though this is the older FTB. The differences between them aren't so significant that we can't cover both versions of this camera with this one. The FTB is an interchangeable lens SLR, and that basically just means you can take the lens off and put a different one on at any time when you're not taking a photo without messing up your, your film. The, the FTB and FTB-N have a light meter, which is a partial spot meter with a 12% central area. Okay, so what does that mean? A spot meter uses a very small area, say about the size of, actually smaller than that, say about the size of this nickel right here, okay? And with a spot meter, that area the size of the nickel would contribute 100% of the metering data to the exposure shutter speed and aperture, right? Partial spot's a little bit bigger, round about the size of this lens cap. It covers 12% of the frame, and 100% of the metering information comes from that central 12%. So if you have something very dark in that center area, everything around it's gonna be really bright. And the converse is true. If you have something very bright in the center, everything around it's gonna be darker than it would actually be. Uh, so just be aware that that partial metering means that the FTB will bias your exposure towards the tones of what's in the center of your frame. The shutter speeds on this are one second to one one thousandth and bulb. And those are right up here on the shutter speed dial. The viewfinder magnification is 0.85x and it has 94% frame coverage. Now what that means is that what you see in the viewfinder is 85% the size of what's going to be on the film, and that what you see in here is slightly less than what's on the film. So let's imagine that what you're seeing in the frame right now is what ends up on the film. 94% frame coverage means that about 3% on each side and the top and bottom are on the film but are not in your viewfinder. And that means you have a little bit of flexibility with your uh, cropping when you print your film or after you digitize it. The viewfinder screen in this is a matte field with a central microprism and metering area indicator. So there is a circle, if you look through the viewfinder on your FTB, that's your metering area. Anything outside of that circle does not contribute to your meter reading, everything inside of it does. And the flash sync on this camera is 1 60th of a second, which we know because the 60th is orange. The target market for the Canon FTB was advanced but not professional. The standard lenses on this included the 55mm f1.2, the 50mm f1.4, and the 50mm f1.8, which is what this had. So back in the day, you could go to a camera store and buy an FTB or whatever other model you wanted, and then the majority of the difference in that tier is which lens it came with. Did it come with the 1.2, the 1.4, or the 1.8? And the 1.8 would have been the least expensive of the three. The camera itself would have been the same, but the lens on the front of it would have determined which tier you were buying for. 1.2 would have been more money than cents. 1.4 would have been uh, somebody who's really focused on getting a fast quality lens. And 1.8 is somebody who is looking for a good sharp lens and uh, is also looking to be on a little bit of a budget. The two high spec lenses for this uh, camera would have been targeted toward a more advanced audience, whereas the lower spec lens would have been targeted towards your general everyday shooter. The camera also included some nice features for the day, such as quick loading, which we'll see in the second video, a meter on off switch, which is right here, which is meter is on, meter is off, flash still works, and battery check. A shutter lock, which is right over here, and stop down metering for FL lenses. So I have an FL lens on here right now. This was designed to use the FD lenses, but you could do stop down metering with FL, and I will show you how to do that in the second video. The FTB was made by Canon in Japan from 1971 to 1973 for this version, and then the new version was made from 73 to 76. It was preceded by the Canon FT, which is uh, in another box. It was concurrent with the F1, the TLB, and the TX, and I have a TX right here, and you can see that basically the main difference between the FTB and the TX 
This is a, a lower tier camera. Different interface here with less options on the self timer stop down switch and no battery button over there. So the battery button was a, an indicator of it being a higher tier camera basically. And it was followed by the AT1. So when the A line came out, the AT1 is the camera that was most like the FTB. And frankly, of the A series cameras, a little bit off topic, the AT1 is the best for students as well. So now as we do, we're gonna go over the features and functions on this camera and uh, talk about what they are. In the second video, we'll talk about what everything is and how you can use it to take photos. We'll start on the front, technically, with the strap lugs right here. This is the film rewind knob and lever that allows you to rewind the film and open the cameras back. On off switch, meter is on. All this does is activate the meter. You can still use the every camera function in off. That is only for the meter. And then battery check. Um, the meter in this camera is shot, so I'm not gonna be able to show you how the meter works. Serial number, flash hot shoe. Over here, this solid line is your shutter speed index, which tells you what your shutter speed is set to. This back here is your film plane indicator, which tells you where the film is, so that if you're using this camera for extreme macros, you can get very precise measurements. Shutter speed dial. If you lift the shutter speed dial, you can adjust your film speed. ASA and ISO, ISO is what we use today, are the exact same thing. So if you have 400 ISO film, let's say, you just want to set the ASA to 400 and you will get proper meter readings. Film advance lever right here to advance your film and rearm your shutter. Shutter release button. Shutter release lock, so set that way. You cannot accidentally take an exposure, which is nice, a good way to save film. Frame count window with the index here to tell you which frame you are on. On the camera's front, there we go. We have the quick load indicator, meaning that this has quick load, model designation, FTB, Canon, lens mounting index, lens mount, flash PC port, and then here we have the self timer and stop down metering combination lever. So stop down metering, you push it in that way, and it will hold until oops, you reset. So stop down metering is in effect, reset stop down metering. If you don't want to have it lock, you just leave that pushed in and then it will automatically pop back out after you do stop down metering. This is also good for depth of field previews so you can look in your viewfinder and see approximately what your depth of field is gonna be. Now your self timer is the other way. I think that mirror is supposed to come back down after that happens. There it goes, maybe not. Yeah, it is. Okay, so uh, mechanism on this camera is a bit wonky. That happens with older cameras sometimes. So to use the self timer, you just push this all the way out. And then when you trip the shutter button, the self timer will start. The reason that the self timer started automatically previously was because I had already tripped the shutter button and not advanced the film. There we go. So that is how you use the self timer. We'll see how to do stop down metering with FL lenses in the second video. On the camera's side, we have the battery chamber right here. Here we go, and I'll show you how to change the batteries in the second video. On the camera's back, we have the viewfinder. And on the viewfinder, we have a couple of accessory grooves here, so you could put things like diopters or right angle viewers onto the viewfinder as uh, to, to expand the system and have different usability. On the camera's bottom, we have the tripod socket and the film rewind button. And then to get into the camera, we just lift up the film rewind knob. And if these light seals weren't glue, <laughs> it would just pop right open. Okay, so the light seals and the channels here are glue on this camera because they've decomposed over time. But realistically, this should, oh, it's coming off on my fingers too. Um, just pop right open. This is the quick load system, which we'll see how to use in video two. Film cassette chamber, ow, right here, which is where, where we'll put the film to load it. Film guide rails, the ones on the outside, 
keep the film from moving up and down as it travels, and the ones on the inside keep the film flat when the film pressure plate sandwiches the film like that right there. So you can see how the film is being guided by those guide rails. Film guide pins that further help keep the film moving through the camera smoothly. This is the film tension sprocket, and when you advance the film, it spins, and it will not let the film move backwards unless you push the film rewind button, and then it spins freely. Here we have the shutter curtain. This is the quick load arms, honestly one of Canon's best innovations. Uh, this, we think about it, this came out in the early 70s, right? Quick load, this loading film was not as simple as it was in this camera again until like the late 80s or early 90s. I have to imagine that this must have been really expensive to make, otherwise Canon would have kept using it in their cameras because it is awesome. Film leader index for the quick load system. Film rollers, which help keep tension on the sprocket here as the film's going through it so that it gets taken up by the film take-up spool. Film pressure plate right here. And then on the very back of the door is this cassette spring, which sandwiches the cassette in place so that the cassette will load the film properly and allow it to be rewind without binding up. Some notes on the FTB and FTBN. They are almost identical. The N version has a few minor improvements. So like I mentioned, this features the FTB, but fun and functionally they're, they're the same. The N has in the viewfinder a shutter speed display. It also has a larger shutter button than this. It has a uh, plastic tip advance lever so that it's a little bit easier on the fingers when you advance the film, especially over and over and over again. These old knurled metal film advance levers could get really rough on the fingers after a day of shooting. And the combined stop down and self timer lever is a little bit slimmer and just a little bit smaller of a feature on the front of that camera. This lever specifically is smaller on the new one. Personally, I like this one a little bit better. Canon's Camera Museum recognizes the FTB-N, but there's no official designation engraved onto the cameras for the difference, only the exterior cosmetic differences. If you're, if you're looking to buy one of these and it has a different stop-down lever than this, it's an N. Or if it has a plastic-tipped lever, it's an N. So, easy way to tell them apart. Internally, they're the same. So some things not to do with your camera. Don't store your camera with the shutter ready to fire. Basically, if you're done shooting for the day, trigger your shutter. Even if you have some film in here, it's, th these are clockwork. So when you arm the shutter, what happens is you're putting a bunch of tension onto springs. And if you leave the tension on those springs for days or weeks at a time, or longer sometimes, I've seen these come out of closets with the shutters that have been armed for 30 years, the springs will get strained. They'll develop a memory of being stre stretched out like this and they'll either in time break or they won't be as springy and then your shutter times will be off. So always trigger the shutter before you store it, even overnight. Don't touch the shutter curtain itself and don't touch the mirror. If you touch the shutter curtain, you can brick your camera and that's a really good way to make it a paperweight. If you touch the mirror, your finger oils can desilver the mirror and that will impair your ability to focus and it can also throw off your metering. Don't leave your camera or lenses in your car because the heat can damage them. This lens right here, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll do some stop down metering here really quickly. And you can see that the aperture does not close and that's because somebody left this lens in a car, not me. There we go, you can see the aperture is wide open even though it's stopped down at f16. So what happened with this lens is that it was left in the heat and oils got thin. They got onto the aperture and into the aperture mechanism where they shouldn't be. And then when it came back to normal temperature, they got back to their normal viscosity and um, that, that was that. They, uh, they, are the, the, they have now made it so that this aperture will not work unless I completely take apart this lens and um, 
uh, clean the aperture blades. The same thing can happen in the camera. Your lubricating oils can get to places they shouldn't be and gum up the works. Likewise, in the cold, the lubricating oils can break down and become permanently gummy, which can throw off your shutter timing and camera operation. Also, leaving your camera in the car, even if you're just popping into the gas station to get a snack or something like that, really easy way to come back out to your car and say that you have a broken window and no camera. So don't leave it in your car, even just for, for a few minutes, always take your camera gear with you. Don't store your camera gear in a plastic bag or box unless you have a rechargeable desiccant pack in it. Rechargeable ones are ones that you can just pop into the oven at 300 degrees for a few hours and then continue using them. The ones that you get like in a pack of beef jerky or uh, with clothes are not rechargeable. They will set your place on fire if you put them in the oven. Please don't do it. At any rate, get the rechargeable ones if you're going to store this in a plastic bag or box because plastic is permeable so moisture can get into it which will cause fungus to grow on your lens elements and in your camera's leatherette and that will make your optics not perform well and it will make your leatherette smell musty which is not pleasant when you hold the camera up next to your nose. Don't let this get wet because there are minor electronic components in it and getting wet can affect those, but more importantly, it's all metal on the inside. It's not weather sealed, so if water gets inside of it, it can cause the internal components to rust, and that's that. Uh, that will rust your gears together. That, is, that happened to a camera. I had bought a camera at one point, not this one, that had the gears had rusted together because they got wet, either submerged or rained on, not sure which. At any rate, keep this dry if you're outside and you are in a rainstorm. And just remember your Canon FTB is a precision tool and should be handled with care and respect. And as long as you take care of your camera, your camera will take care of you. All right, so that was it. That was the first video about this, the Canon FTB. Oof. We covered everything that there is on the camera. In the second video, we're gonna talk about what all of it is and how to use it to take photos with this camera. <laughs> Thank you for watching this video. Please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comments section below. I'm pretty good about checking these every couple of days and answering questions. If you have any suggestions or ideas for future videos, and if I have the technical know-how and equipment, I'm more than happy to make those. One last thing, thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. I gotta get up, Steinbeck. I have to turn off the camera. <laughs>